Hello, and welcome to Higher Aim with Dr. Kurt Dodd. We are so glad you've joined us. Before we jump into today's episode, we would like to tell you about one of the resources we use at Higher Aim to encourage hearts and empower lives, and that's our monthly Bible teaching letter. In each letter, Dr. Kurt Dodd gives you a more in-depth look at the topic of one of his sermons and helps you dive deeper as you study God's Word. The letter is delivered to your home each month and is absolutely free. To begin receiving your monthly Bible teaching letter, visit our website at higheraim.org and click on the teaching letter option at the top of the screen. You can also call our help center at 1-800-491-4400 as operators are standing by now to help you register for the Bible teaching letter. We hope this resource is a blessing to you as you continue to grow in your walk with Christ. Now, please enjoy today's message from Dr. Kurt Dodd. You know where we are? The book of Revelation. Surprise, surprise, surprise. And we are almost through. However, I want to take enough time to unpack these last words for us, beginning in chapter 21, and I'm going to read the entire section that speaks of everything new, a new glimpse of heaven as never before. The capital city, the new Jerusalem is before us. We've gone through such a difficult section going through uh, the, uh, the great tribulation period. We've gone through Armageddon. We've gone through the great, great white throne judgment. We've seen the lake of fire. We've seen the devil's demise. And now this picture uh, describing everything new is very powerful. So allow me to read to you this lengthy passage beginning in verse 9 of chapter 21 and then all the way through verse 5. And we're going to go as far as we can uh, today. And I don't know how long that will be, but we'll take one step at another because there's some amazing pictures. In fact, uh, what I'm about to read to you is so amazing uh, that words don't describe it. I, I, I don't think these words from first century John uh, writing this really captures the glory because it's limited by words. Just like I cannot express to you what I felt during that Swahili worship service that defies uh, imagination and, and, and words, uh, you, you got to be there. And this is, I think, the very same feeling. You got to be there. So why don't you follow along with me as I read? Here's what the scripture says One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came. And said to me, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high, and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. It shone with the glory of God, and its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel, like, like a jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with 12 gates and with 12 angels at the gates. On the gates were written the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. There were three gates on the east, three on the north, three on the south, and three on the west. The wall of the city had 12 foundations. And on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. The angel who talked with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city, its gates, and its walls. The city was laid out like a square, as long as it was wide. He measured the city with the rod and found it to be 12,000 stadia in length, and as wide and high as it is long. The angel measured the wall using human measurement, and it was 144 cubits thick. The wall was made of jasper and the city of pure gold as pure as glass. The foundations of the city walls were decorated with every kind of precious stone. 
The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth ruby, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth turquoise, the eleventh jacinth, and the twelfth amethyst. The twelve gates were twelve pearls, each gate made of a single pearl. The great street of the city was of gold, as pure as transparent glass. I did not see a temple in the city, because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and the Lamb is its lamp. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. On no day will its gates ever be shut, for there will be no night there. The glory and honor of the nations will be brought into it. Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life as clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. And all God's people said, <clears throat> what a picture. What a picture to grab hold of. In fact, I will tell you, if I can get my voice fully functional today, that, that this so overpowers us that uh, it almost numbs us. And we read it and we go, I can't get my mind around that because this sight is unlike anything I have ever seen on a movie or a painting or any kind of picture. This defies description. But John does the best he can. And remember the last time we were together, we saw the very first thing. There was a glimpse, and there are three glimpses for us to view here in this passage that I've read. The first glimpse was that of a servant's responsibility, and we looked at that. And so I'm not going to go into that uh, this morning, but that's how that passage is teed off with a servant's responsibility. That angel gives us a glimpse of our responsibility to, to represent the Lord both in the good times and in the bad times, in times of judgment and in times of blessing. We are to be his representative. But there's another thing I want to share with you, and that is a glimpse of the city from the outside, a glimpse of the city from outside. In verses 11 through 21, we're going to unpack this and make it very, very simple because well, I need it very simple, and maybe you do too. And I want to share with you several things about the city when we look at it in John's description. The very first thing is it shines. It shines. The brilliance of the, the, this picture is seen in verse 11, shining with the glory of God, described like that of a precious jewel, like, like jasper, as clear as crystal. Uh, that, that's uh, an image of, if you will, an illustration, quite frankly, of God's city being illuminated. In fact, it, the Greek word here that is used is the, the word phoster. It's where we get phosphorescent. It's light. And it is the very same word used to describe uh, the light of the world, who is Jesus as well as his children in Matthew 5, 4, who are to reflect the image of God. This is the image of, of, 
of a transparent and gleaming rock crystal. Uh, it's amazing. It's the very first thing that John captures as he sees the holy city. It shines. Uh, imagine the brilliance of anything that has ever come close to blinding your eyes in its magnificence. This is the first picture, the first glimpse of the city from outside. Number two, it's secure. In verses 12 and 13, the great wall, it's a high wall, and it's with 12 gates guarded by 12 angels at the gates. What a security team right there. In a time where, where people are worried about uh, their safety from uh, someone who may enter a large crowded facility and begin to fire, well, this picture of heaven is totally secure, totally secure. And the gates, the Bible tells us, are, are right there. And there is a high, high wall. All of that comes together to describe security. And no one gets in without a pass quite frankly, and we're going to talk about that later. Each gate, the Scripture tells us, had the name of one of the 12 tribes of Israel. So there is a, a reason for, for all of this. Three gates on each side of the four sides. What a, a picture of security, high wall, gates guarded by angels. That's a picture. And on a, a time uh, line that we're living, that issue of security ought to speak to your heart. There's another thing I want you to see. It's stable. There in verse 14, there are 12 foundations, not just one, not just one, but 12 foundations. Uh, a couple of years ago, with the help of some good buddies, I uh, built Oh, let me say, we built, okay, I helped, uh, a man cave uh, that I used during COVID as my uh, office. And we had one foundation, and we ended up making it deep enough that uh, we could uh, put a frost blanket on so it uh, wouldn't crack during those times. And uh, can you imagine 12 foundations? Your home having 12 foundations. Well, that's what the Scripture tells us. Each of those foundations have a name, a name of one of the apostles. Wow. Yeah, and you know that Judas' name is not there, undoubtedly. It, it's either Matthias, as the early church, before they became the church, uh, had... Uh, rolled uh, lots and picked Matthias there in the upper room, or maybe it's Paul. Maybe it's Paul that God would choose in the days to come. We don't know. That's for discussion among yourself. But the Scripture gives us a glimpse that these men who carried the gospel with their lives and paid a tremendous price, all of them with their lives for the kingdom of God, that is the foundation of the new Jerusalem. It's not Simon Peter alone. You need to know that. It's all 12 of them, and that's important for us to grab hold of. Also, there's another picture. It's square. It's square. There in verses 15 and 16, the Bible says it's 12,000 stadia. Um, it's approximately... 1,500 miles square. That's like between Omaha and Sacramento, California. Wow. You think about that, about that picture. And as high as it is wide. It's a huge square. 15,000 miles. Excuse me. Uh, 1,500 uh, miles. Is that right? 12,000 stadia. 15,000. Man, what a glimpse. That's th one building, one building, all under one foundation resting. It, wh what a, uh, a picture. I mean, as high as it is long. You know, I, I have often said that um, you can imagine the elevator in that place. But if you remember... <clears throat> 
There's no need for elevators. You remember Jesus? His post-resurrection body could appear behind locked doors. Wow. You're gonna, going to have that ability as a child of God in the new heaven. So I would imagine that uh, you won't need stairs and you won't need elevators. If I was going to, to, to visit one of you, I would just probably go, okay, I know where they are because my memory is complete at that point, and I will remember where your mansion is, and I'll knock on your door and have a chance to visit with you uh, just to think it, and there, bang, they're there. That's the picture I want you to, to see of heaven. It, it is not only square, but it's sturdy. There in verse 17, an angel is sent out to measure the wall, <clears throat> and the wall is 144 cubics thick, the wall. Now, unless you're a, a cubic uh, mathematician, uh, let me just tell you, that's approximately 216 feet thick. That's a thick wall. Imagine running the electrical through that. Uh, I mean, this is a, a, a massive, massive wall. And that's just the thickness of the wall. But you can imagine you would need that kind of thickness to sustain a building that high. Well, God's the one that makes it all stay together, and that's why it is sturdy. And then there is another picture here. It's, it's stunning. It's stunning. There in verse 18, the Bible says, the walls are made of pure jasper and the city of pure gold as pure as glass, and as clear as glass. All I got to say is the theological word in Greek, wowzers. Uh, I, I will tell you, this, that, that blows my mind just to, to get a glimpse of the walls being clear and, and crystal and, and just unbelievably brilliant. It's stunning. In verse 19 and 20, the wall's foundations the wall's foundations, the Bible says, are decorated with every kind of precious stone. So, the foundational walls are decorated. They're not only thick, but they're also stunning because they're inlaid with the jewels that, com uh, that complement the breastplate of the high priest from the Old Testament. Uh, I, I told you that the best commentary on Scripture is Scripture. And if you look at it, you look at what God did for the, the Hebrew children to even to tell them what to build and how to build it and to describe uh, what the high priest would wear. And he would wear this ephod that would go around his neck and there were 12 jewels in it. And that's how God would speak concerning different tribes and selecting different tribes out for particular reasons. And these jewels that now are not in the high priest's breastplate, but they're, they're all over the, the, the wall foundations are, are this. The first is jasper. That's kind of an orange. The second, sapphire, blue. Third, chalcedony, or agate, kind of a pale blue. The fourth, emerald, well, that's green. Fifth, sardonyx, or onyx, burnt orange, that's that picture. Uh, the sixth, cornelian, ruby, that's blood red. The seventh, chrysolite, uh, that is golden. Uh, the eighth, beryl, that's kind of a pale blue greenish color. The eighth barrel, or rather, I've already shared that with you. The ninth topaz, which is a brownish yellow. The tenth chrysophase, which uh, is turquoise or kind of an apple greenish, if you will. The eleventh jacinth, that's violet. The twelfth amethyst, that's purple. Can you imagine uh, looking at that? 
not just a small section, but the entire wall's foundation decorated with all of those precious stones. Ah, that's why I tell you it's stunning. And adding to that stunning picture, verse 21 tells us the 12 gates were 12 pearls, each gate made of a single pearl. Now, you know where pearls come from, don't you? Oysters. Uh, you may not like to eat oysters. You, uh, I personally do. Uh, you just let them slide down. They're good, especially with horse, horseradish. And I can share this because this is the early service. And, uh, it, but those oysters are small, and they make small pearls that are considered uh, jewelry and, and wonderful gifts to give. Uh, but these gates are giant, and they're made from one single pearl. Imagine the oyster that coughed that one up. There's 12 of them. I mean, how do you get your mind around this? This is unbelievable, overpowering. Uh, whatever you do when you read Scripture, especially when the pictures are more powerful than the words can absolutely comprehend or describe, is you just need to meditate on it and let it spiritually blow you away. Anything God has ever created doesn't even come close to what this looks like. This is amazing, and it's all made by Him. Remember, it comes down from heaven. We've already seen that. There's a third thing I want to share with you, and that is the glimpse of the city on the inside. In verse 21, we see gates. Again, one pearl for each gate. Two, uh, another picture from <clears throat> the inside of the city is a gold street, the main street. It's made of gold, pure, transparent gold. What a glimpse of purity, but also <clears throat> what a picture of the worthlessness of the gold, the very commodity that we look at as the thing that you ought to have in unstable financial markets. It's used as street paving. Wow. <laughs> what a glimpse of totally uh, inverted values, what we consider as the most important to have in our hands. It's worthless, and it's used as paving. That ought to tell you something, and there's a reason for that. Also, I want you to see that there is no temple in the city. All building programs have now ceased. ceased. There is no need to build a church. Do you know reason, the reason why uh, churches were very ornate uh, in certain centuries? It was to point to the glory of God. Now, there is no reason for a building to be ornate to point to the glory of God because the glory of God, God's presence, is now with us. I mean, what an unbelievable picture that God is with us and there's no need for a building. No need for a building. You know, I, I, I read years ago that the reason people go to certain churches is because of the architecture. It's about 3%, honestly. Uh, who knows what it is today, but I will tell you that uh, some people like the traditional facade uh, out on our front building because it makes them uh, remember columns and all that kind of good stuff. In fact, the very first church uh, our church built, which is on Pacific Street, is a miniature of this church, and that, that's a wonderful thing, and now churches are, are built like all kinds of different ways. But here's the deal. We, we don't need church buildings any longer because we are with God. And that's a beautiful picture. And we get the real thing, God himself. And we don't need to have anything to block the view or to distract us. I also want you to see the lighting uh, that, it, that takes place inside the city. There's no need for outside light. 
Verse 23 shares that with us. God's presence gives light, and the Lamb, Jesus, is its lamp. In other words, wow again. I mean, just the glory of God. You remember the Shekinah glory that we saw on the Mount of Transfiguration when uh, Peter, James, and John were with Jesus, and Peter wanted to go into a building program? And when he saw Jesus, he saw the Shekinah glory of God. Uh, his, he was transformed. In other words, his inner nature began to shine through his outer flesh. And now the Shekinah glory of God is not contained within flesh. It shines everywhere. And there is no need for the sun. There is no need for fabricated light. It is the Lord himself. You see, in Scripture here, when we look at the, the, the New Jerusalem, the king is the light, and he, his presence shines everywhere. The glory and honor of the nations will be brought in to it, but it's still all the glory of all the nations are overpowered by the light of Jesus. He is the light of the world, and he is the light of heaven. This is an amazing thing. There's another thing I want you to see. There's an open-door policy. The gates will always be open. Yeah, think about that. I mean, the front door is unlocked. In fact, the screen door is open. The front door is open. The back door is open. Everything, the side doors are all open. They're never shut. You go, within. Well, why does... God need to have gates if they're never shut. Well, because he had to do something to use those pearls. <laughs> Basically, it's a picture of open wide to come into God's presence. It's important for us. There's no danger here. There's no impurity whatsoever inside or outside. It's everything new. I mean, that ought to get you right now because it's all brand new. I know that many of you are asking, how long is our culture going to go dark? How long will this go? Long enough. And then when God remakes everything, it's all new. And there is no danger whatsoever. Again, no impurity whatsoever. And that's why the gates can be wide open. And then there, I want you to look at the residents. Though we do not see particular pictures of individuals that John sees, he tells us that the only people that can go there and go in and out of the New Jerusalem who have residence there are those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. And that's God's database for those who know Christ. And I pray that your name is on that. And there is another thing that I, I want you to see. And we're going to end here because I got much more to tell you. But you can't handle it. I know it because uh, we're geared to an hour. We're geared to an hour. But I wish we could go longer like the uh, church in Africa. Uh, Maybe next week. But anyway, I will tell you there is one more thing I want you to see until we come back together again, the Lord willing, and that is the river of the water of life. Verse 20, uh, 1 and 2 out of chapter 22 describes it flowing from the throne of God, that God is the, the, the very one who gives the source of life, and it flows from his throne. Get that picture. It flows right down the middle of the city. I mean, I, I like this picture. I, I think about this river of life. I, and you know where I go. I think there's got to be some trophy-sized fish in that river. I mean, <clears throat> though we don't uh, see pictures of animals uh, in the Scripture in heaven, Remember, Jesus comes back and his army comes back riding on white horses. So if God would send horses from heaven, surely there's got to be fish in this particular river. At least I'm holding out for that. But the Bible says it's clear as crystal. So that gear gives me a feeling this is a, a fly fishing river, quite honestly. Uh, 
But it's a beautiful picture that all life flows from God and uh, emanates from his presence. And then the, the Scripture tells us that that river of life, well, it's overarched by the tree of life. I had to give you that because that fits with the river. There in verse 2, it's on each side of the river. So it spans the river. Both of its root systems go over the river. Get that as an image. And it bears 12 crops of fruit, yielding fruit every month. Leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. I don't know about you, but... Uh, Wow. The only place that a nation will find healing is in the presence of God. And if there was ever th anything that I could ever share with you, it's our country needs a taste of these leaves. And the only way for any country or any man, any state, any woman, any county, any city, any child to ever experience full healing is to come to Christ. Find yourself drawn to the presence of God. You know, that's why we do worship. You know that, don't you? The reason we do worship is to welcome the presence of God. He's already here, but there's something very powerful about praise. In fact, the Scripture tells us God inhabits the praises of His people. And I don't know about you, but I want to be where God is. You know, as I'm thinking back about Africa, i got to tell you, I hadn't been in a worship service like that and saw God's Spirit move like that since the early 70s. I don't know if it was because they sang for over an hour, nonstop, no break, and they worshiped extravagantly before the Lord with pure joy. These people who have nothing. This is one of the poorest areas in Nairobi. There is a poorer one that's uh, Shack City with, with uh, over 350,000 living in, in uh, 10 homes stacked one on top of the other. But this area was the number one area of crime in Nairobi until something happened. During COVID, the church began to open up its gates and allowed the water that was pumped for on the church grounds not to be sold but given to all the people, and the crime went down just like that. And now people flock to that church for the life-giving water of the gospel. And I tell you something, uh, there's something powerful about being in the presence of God and feeling the flow of His Spirit and God visiting people, and, and, and they respond immediately. Maybe the problem is in our country to, today is that we are not thirsty enough. How long will it take us to realize how dry we are? And the moment that we come to that dryness and cry out, oh, Jesus, save me, help me, change me, make me yours, that's when we will feel and sense the life-giving water of the river of life flowing through each and every one of us. I pray that you know Jesus. You know, I know that you've probably heard the gospel a gazillion times. But, you know, it's one thing to hear the gospel and actually understand the facts of the gospel. It's another thing to receive Jesus as Lord of your life and respond to the gospel. And let me just tell you something. Jesus said, no man can come unto me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up in the last days. 
If you have never sensed that drawing of the Spirit of God, and you do today, I pray that you would respond to Christ without any doubt, without any hesitation. Don't try to figure it out. Just respond to the tug of the Spirit of God. I pray that you would become more than information, uh, informational, uh, factoid uh, treasure hunters. Too many of us, we want information, but not transformation. And what we need to change us is the transforming power of the Spirit of God. And I pray that today, if God is walking by the front door of your heart, you'd say yes. Maybe you're watching online or by television. I pray that you would respond right now. Call us on that 800 number. There's somebody who is ready now to talk to you about giving your life to Christ, to show you how. And if you're here today and God's speaking to you and you're longing to want to know that you know that you know him, assured that you'll go to heaven and experience the new Jerusalem, then I pray that if you don't have that peace, you'll come and find your way down front here in a moment, would you? Or maybe you're here and you feel like God wants you to be part of this church family. I pray that you would come and and talk to one of the folks who will be coming. Or maybe you just need to make this an altar prayer. Because for some reason or other, you feel like the light that used to shine in your life and through your life is a bit dull. The picture of heaven is brightness. God wants that for you. And maybe, just maybe, today is the first step of recapturing the light that used to shine through your life. Come back to Christ. Thanks for watching Higher Aim with Dr. Kurt Dodd. Visit higheraim.org for more free resources. There, you can access our daily devotions, sign up for our monthly teaching letter, even download the Higher Aim app, and so much more. Just go to higheraim.org to get started.